Um, we are recording, and can we confirm, are we broadcasting on Holden TV and through YouTube? The YouTube stream is live. Great. Thank you, everyone. Um, the first order of business uh, for tonight is public hearing. I believe we have one person that has signed up for public hearing is uh, Philip Grantsowitz here. I do not have him on yet. Okay. Is there anybody else, um, Barry or Randy, that signed up for public hearing? Uh, no, that was the only one, and it came in pretty late um, within the last half hour. Sure. I just sent okay. him the link um, like 10 minutes ago. Okay. Um, so without objection, I'd like to take uh, one thing out of order. I believe uh, we have a number of guests with us today. Um, who are students uh, in the district as part of the student representatives report. So without objection, I'd like to take the students rep representatives report next and turn it over to Catherine. All right, thank you all um, so much. So as a lot of you know, when I was elected, I really wanted to increase um, student voice in the committee. And so um, through social media, um, you know, we've created those platforms and a lot of the questions we were getting were about middle schoolers and way we, ways we could better reach them or keep them informed. Um, stuff like that. So when November came around, I asked the principals for a few students who I could just talk to um, really quickly one time. Um, and we decided that these conversations were really beneficial for both administration and for the students um, and for me as well. And so we decided we were going to keep those conversations going. So it went from we had this group of students and we decided to pull them from all the schools and it went from five eighth grade students. Now we have um, 11 students from all five schools um, and their grades five through eight. Um, they're like the highlight of my week every week. Um, I don't know many high schoolers that would choose to sit on Zoom for another hour to talk about um, school. Um, and they they come every every month or every couple of weeks willing to talk about school. Um, they're, they're all just so amazing. They're engaged. They have such great ideas, um, positive feedback. It's amazing. I know the principals have been so helpful and are so open um, to all the talks um, and everything that comes out of it. So it's been just amazing. Um, I'm so proud of them all. They're all amazing. But um, when Chair Weeks um, was chairing the committee, she asked me um, if I had any students who I thought we could highlight their achievement for. And um, this group was the first thing that I thought of. Um, and so they're here to talk to you tonight. They're going to introduce themselves and talk to you about some of the work that they're doing. Um, and then we'll end through the chair with a few questions um, if you guys have any. So I'm going to pass it to Kenichi because I think he wanted to say a few words um, before I I am extremely proud of this group as well. Uh, I am very happy that they stepped up to this position to help out their schools and the district as a whole. There aren't many clubs at the middle schools, um, and I'm really happy that these students have taken it onto themselves to improve their schools for the better of their peers. I am also excited for when they become freshmen and enter the high school because that means then the high school will also improve as well. Thank you. All right, so middle schoolers, I think you can take it over um, whenever you're ready. We are the Middle School Student Advisory Council. We are all middle school students from across the district. Um. Our long-term goal is to improve middle school life, and right now we are working to reinstate middle school clubs back into our schools. We are looking to launch an art club, a sports club, a community service club, and a diversity club. We have appointed advisors for these clubs and are looking to start them as early as the end of March. Members of the Art Club, Ariel Jesner, Rachel Lee, Ms. Julie Guerin, and myself, Cassie Pinditori, have been working hard to accomplish a goal of getting an art club started for the middle schoolers in the district. I haven't known Ms. Guerin long, but from what I can tell, she's extremely kind and patient 
She's willing to help out in so many ways, especially when it comes to starting this art club. I'm so glad I've gotten the opportunity to work with her on something the two of us and other members of our group are passionate about. Currently, we're working on finding ways to advertise the club and setting up Google Classrooms. Our first meeting is scheduled for April 6th, and our overall goal for this club is to bring people who are passionate about art together and regain the socialization we have lost during the pandemic. We plan to start up sports club to bring together students who share a love for sports. We are thinking of splitting the group into small teams to prepare for some kind of spring competition. This does pose some social distancing issues that we are currently working with middle school principals. We hope to gather more details soon. And thanks to Mr. Clark, our advisor, for helping us put together this club. He has been super patient and creative as we decide how to make this work. The Community Service Club has been working tirelessly to get our club up and running with the assistance of Mrs. Mead, who has helped us reach our goal. We are currently designing a website that will give information to anyone who is interested in joining the club. After the club is launched, we are hoping to arrange food and clothing drives and maintain school trails and grounds. Due to, the, due to this pandemic, we are currently unsure of what we will be able to do with the amount of kids that join and the tasks we are focusing on. Overall, our group is thrilled to be getting closer to, to starting our club and helping the community. Uh, I am Cassie Albert, and I'm working with Emma Day and Hannah Palmy, uh, Palmy, who are two amazing, hardworking eighth graders. Uh, we are super excited to launch our club, um, the Social Justice and Diversity Club, uh, which will hopefully bring more equality, justice, and friendliness to our schools. Um, our main goal is to be a safe space where kids of all, who are of all different races, abilities, sexualities, etc can come together with allies to express their feelings, thoughts, and experiences, and or um, for some help. We, be, we also plan to give like brief lessons or explanations about the history of each of these diverse communities. Our first meeting is scheduled for the first Monday in April and then continued bi-weekly from then on. I don't see Brenna, so I can read her, her section of it, but Brenna was supposed to read hers. Um, we can't wait to get these clubs off the ground. Our next project will be make, working to make the schools more environmentally friendly. Um, pause. All right, I'll keep going. Um, we cannot wait to continue to our improve our school communities. And now we will do a quick introduction of our other members so that you can learn a little bit more about us. Ariel, why don't you start? Okay, I'm going to be introducing Akavli. Akavli is a Mountview Middle School student in eighth grade. She's in Model UN as well as student council leader. She's in Project 351, she loves to play basketball and she's very passionate about helping others. In this way, she's very inspiring and thrives to help others and is always putting everyone first. Go ahead, Akavli. Hi, I'm Akavli and I'm gonna be introducing Arielle. Um, Arielle is also a Mount B Middle School student in eighth grade. She's president of our school's student council and is always coming up with creative ideas. She loves making art and will unfailingly lend her support to anyone who needs it. Arielle always strives to do her best, which makes her a great role model as well as an amazing leader and an even better friend. I'll read Brenna's next um, and then Emma can go. So Emma is an eighth grader at Central Tree Middle School. Emma has been involved in library, teen advisory board, community theater, and GSA. 
I'm going to join the middle school student advisory group to make people smile and have a safe place to talk with others and share her ideas openly. Emma's passion for fighting for equality and making the world a better place has always inspired me. She works hard in everything she does, and she is a great role model. Uh, I'm Emma. The first person I'm going to introduce is Brenna Patnog. Brenna is an eighth grader at Central Tree Middle School. She, she played both soccer and basketball before the, before the pandemic. She was a part of the student council in sixth grade. She joined because she wanted to improve our middle schools and give middle school students an opportunity to get involved into different things. She also joined to make them smile and feel more included. She always inspires me every day about how strong and passionate she fights for things and how easily she can make me laugh at other people around her. The next person I'm going to introduce is Hannah Palmy. Hannah Palmy is an eighth grader from Troxit. She enjoys doing field hockey, track, student council, yearbook committee, and playing the flute. She joined this, com this committee because she has a beautiful love for helping others and making a positive impact on their lives and always making them smile. She inspires me with how committed and fast she gets things done. She's motivated every day and it just makes me smile. Kylie and Toby, you're up next. Okay, um, Kylie is a fifth grader at Chalksit Middle School. She is in many school community clubs. She is on the Chalksit Student Council and writes for the fifth grade newsletter. She is also on a dance team and learning to play the flute. She joined because she wanted to help make the school a better place. Toby Gibson is a sixth grader at Chalksit Middle School. He has been on student council for the past two years and enjoys helping out in school fundraisers and activities. Last year, he participated in the school's drama club. Toby also enjoys playing tennis and other sports with his siblings. He joined the student, student advisory group to help safely start up middle school clubs again. Megan and Cassie. Megan is a sixth grader at Thomas Prince School. She recently joined the Community Service Club. Although she isn't in many clubs, she spends her days filled with her favorite activities. She enjoys spending time outdoor, outdoor, outdoors with her dog and reading in her spare time. She is very hardworking, especially when it comes to cleaning up the environment. And for that, she inspires me. Cassie is an eighth grader at Paxton Center School. She participated in the student council for three years and was the vice president last year. She used to be a member of the school improvement committee as well. Cassie enjoys helping her community and volunteers at vaccine clinics in her town. In her free time, she plays basketball, rides horses, and spends time with her dog. And last but not least, Rachel and Cassie L. Cassie L. is a seventh grader at Mount View. She inspires me by having great worth ethic and always being prepared. She dances and also is an also she dances and is also in the social slash justice diversity club. She joined through social media to have fun and get to know other people in the community. And is an eighth grader there. She loves with the art club. She loves to play basketball and is in her school council. She's a really nice, hardworking student and inspires me to do so much. Rachel's principal actually recommended her for our advisory group, and she likes that she gets to be part of the community. All right, thank you, middle schoolers. I'm through the chair. If anyone has any questions right now. Does anyone have any questions for our guests? Seeing none, I want to um, thank you all for uh, making time to come here today and telling us about the great things that you guys are doing um, and introducing one another, uh, which I thought was a unique way to do it. Uh, very, very cool. Um, and I'm sure that uh, your peers are um, benefiting and, and really appreciate the work that you folks are doing um, to uh, bring some of these clubs to life. So thank you very much for that. 
And thank you, Catherine, for the introductions. So as we move on, um, and by the way, you folks may feel free to to stay or 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 drop. Um, we will certainly understand it if you did not stay. Um, we'll move on to the chair's opening remarks. <clears throat> um, just a few things. Um, you know, tonight uh, we have on the agenda um, our uh, budget approval and budget assessments uh, motion. And the timing of this is important, as we've spoke about in the past. Um, we're required to um, have a minimum number of days before uh, we can pass uh, a budget and send assessments to towns to appear on uh, warrants for town meeting. Um, so we've allocated um, a good the, the vast majority of, of tonight's meeting. Um, we also have a special meeting on the agenda for tomorrow night in the event that we're not able to pass a budget tonight. Um, in order to pass a budget, uh, it requires uh, two-thirds of the school committee membership. Um, that is, uh, we're calculating that as 15 people, so 15 affirmatives in order to pass the, the budget. Um, the one other item that I'll mention is um, just a, a, a question about mechanics. Um, while it's certainly in um, everyone's purview to offer an amendment on the floor, um, my observation and experience has been that in the budget process, that tends not to be a successful way of doing this. Um, it uh, creates the occasion for us to needing to pause, to do math, um, and, you know, it's hard for us to know what 21 other people are thinking when the amendment is put onto the floor um, when we're dealing with the precision of numbers. So while you want, every member certainly has that right, my suggestion and advice would be that we uh, vote on the motion that gets presented uh, after the administration um, presents it and give it an up and down vote. Um, and if it does not pass, uh, we take some time for feedback and give the administration an opportunity to uh, revise it. Um, again, just my suggestion on how to proceed with this. Um, with that, we'll go into the superintendent's report, um, recommendations requiring action by school committee. I'll entertain a motion to accept grant funds to Dawson Elementary School in the amount of $1,000 and Wachusett Regional High School in the amount of $1,000 from the Holden, Holden Garden Club. So moved. Second. So moved. Second. Mm -hmm. Daryl, do you want to speak a little bit about, um, we have a history uh, with receiving grants, very generous grants from the Holden Garden Club in the past. Sure, thank you, Chair Dennis. Uh, over the past several years, we've received um, thousands, literally thousands of dollars from um, this community grant and the Holden Garden Club has just been so generous in terms of helping support um, programs in our schools around gardening, um, you know, at the elementary, middle school, and you know, now the high school. So again, this is something that is, um, it, you know, an honor to be part of. Um, you know, we have, um, you know, a, a lot of thanks for those people who have put forth this kind of funding now during during these challenging times. So we greatly appreciate this and. You know, hopeful that uh, we'll be able to make it turn into something fantastic. Thank you. So open for questions. I believe Kenichi, you have a question. Yes. Um, could we finish our student report? We presented the middle school students. However, the presentation for high school side was not done. Uh, you know, I'm sorry, Kanich, I didn't realize that you folks weren't done. So um, why don't we, uh, we'll finish this motion and then we'll go back and we'll do the conclusion of the uh, student report uh, without objection. Thank you very much. Any other questions on the motion that's on the table? Yep. Mike, this is Malia. <laughs> and Malia? Yep, sorry. I didn't really have a question. I did just want to reiterate um, the value of these grants. I um, sit on the Agriculture Commission and we see the results of community gardens. We've had a couple of these at schools my son has attended and seen the bigger impact. I know the work the Agricultural Club at the high school has been doing um, and it's really quite amazing the turnaround they've had in the past couple of years. They restarted and they've been doing a lot of great work up there. Um, so I wanted to just reiterate that from that perspective that this is a really great 
thing and particularly that component, I'm really very excited to see. Um, so I appreciate the support and their grant. Thank you, Malia. Anyone else? If nothing else, then um, Randy, can you call the roll? Sure. Member Ayala? Ayala, yes. Member Bennett? Bennett, yes. Member Brown? Brown, yes. Member Gustafson? Yes. Member Haber? Haber, yes. Member Imber? Imber, yes. Member Knowlton? Knowlton, yes. Member Kirschenbaum? Kirschenbaum, yes. Member Lavoie? Lavoie, yes. Member Longbleal? Longbleal, yes. Member Mills? Mills, yes. Member Mitchell? Mitchell, yes. Member Otmar? Otmar, yes. Member Pantos? Pantos, yes. Member Shapiro? Shapiro, yes. Member Silva? Silva, yes. Member Smith? Smith, yes. Member Sullivan? Sullivan, yes. Member Williamson? Williamson, yes. Member Woodland? Woodland, yes. Member Young? Young, yes. Chair Dennis? Dennis, yes. It was unanimous. Great. Again, thank you to the um, Holden Garden Club for that generous grant to our two schools. All right, without, except, without uh, objection, we'll go back, and my apologies, uh, Catherine and Kenichi, um, to um, resume your um, student report. Um, I can go first. Well, first, I want to thank you all for um, letting those middle schoolers come on. They're all amazing. Um, and I know you guys are smiling as much as I smile every time I see them. So um, I'm glad that they were able to um, meet you all. Um, this week, we have NHS inductions at the high school. We're inducting 122 new juniors and seniors to NHS, which will make our NHS total 260 plus. Um, football starts this Friday, um, and they're allowed to have two visitors, um, both home and away, whether it's football or cheerleading, that will all be there. Um, volleyball started today. Um, this uh, last week was a halfway point of quarter three. Um, seniors 50-day countdown started last week. Um, the school newspaper started a podcast that they've been using to highlight um, teachers and other events happening in the school. Um, and then Wellness Day, which happened last Wednesday. Um, I know I told you guys about it, but it just happened and it was so amazing. And I will hand it over to Kenichi. Yep, so in addition to the football game, uh, there may be a pep band. Uh, depends on how the school responds to the wind ensemble group up at the high school. In addition to that, um, last Saturday, the 13th of March, uh, juniors took the SAT. Multiple students from other schools came as well. I'd like to thank all faculty who were acted as proctors at the school and all the janitors who cleaned up for us um, after we took the test. There will be two other SATs. Um, one is on May 8th and the other is on June 5th. Uh, please keep an eye on College Board uh, as the Cutoff dates uh, for those tests are roughly a month away from those proposed dates. And that is all for the student report. Thank you for that. Any questions for um, Catherine or Kenichi? Okay, thank you. Um, so again, without objection, um, we do have our um, a member of the public here uh, to speak through public hearing, was not here when we took the public hearing section up. I'm inclined to, to go ahead. Um, uh, again, as with all public hearings, I'd ask that uh, members of the public uh, may address their comments through the chair. Please limit your uh, commentary to two minutes. Um, and um, you may certainly feel free to submit any written portion of that um, to the secretary to be included in the minutes. So with that said, uh, Philip Grantsowitz. Yes, hi. Um, I'd like to address the committee uh, with regards to um, the plans for reopening on April 6th. Um, 
at last week's meeting, it was discussed that there was a possibility that Wednesdays would remain a half a day session for the kids. Um, I'd like to strongly um, express my opposition to that type of approach. Um, our kids have been out of school now for over a year. Um, I think they need every single full day back in school, back in that classroom at this point. Um, I think a half a day, um, even for, for the last uh, quarter here is a real um, short changing of them even further. Um, I would strongly urge people to not support that approach. Um, also, um, recent research is showing that um, a three foot distance is acceptable in schools. There's a lot of research out there for those on the committee who still feel um, obligated to uh, or uneasy about anything less than six feet. I would highly recommend that you uh, go out there because there's a lot of information that says it is safe. So thank you for your time. Great, thank you. All right, picking back up with the superintendent's uh, report, um, we'll now go to the fiscal 22 budget appropriation topic and turn it over to uh, Daryl for a presentation and update on the budget. Great, thank you, Mike. And what I'll do is I'm going to be sharing my screen with everyone. And I'll do our presentation. So again, this is our FY22 um, budget presentation. We also have an update on uh, in-person learning that we will do after um, the, the discussion and vote on the budget. So on our agenda, it includes our budget overview. We're gonna talk a little bit about budget offsets, uh, appropriation breakdown, revenues, town assessments, and then we'll do the budget calendar. So uh, right now we've had a few different uh, revisions prior to even putting it out on the floor for the committee to vote on. So on the 8th of February, we were um, at about a 4.61% increase. That was able to come down over um, a few weeks because we were able to get our insurance number a little more solidified, which um, allowed us to then bring our budget down to about 3.8%. Uh, at the March 8th budget hearing, we were able to bring the number down to 3% as, uh, again, we would started to get some um, discussions or, or have some discussions with the towns um, informally. And, you know, we knew there was some concern on their side around uh, the increase in terms of their assessments. Uh, this evening, what we're presenting to you is a 2.8 or just basically rounded up to 2.9% increase. And we were able to do that. We were able to do that by including the additional use of transportation stabilization. And again, for our trans transportation stabilization account, we can only use that as an offset for transportation expenses only. We can't take those funds and move them from one appropriation or into another appropriation. They have to be used completely for transportation. We have our budget offsets. And again, these are our updated budget offsets. So for um, circuit breaker carry forward from FY21, we're bringing in uh, about 1.5 million. For FY22, the new circuit breaker will be using close to 2.5 million. This is the transportation stabilization that I just mentioned to you. We've increased that to a million dollars. Our FY22 240 grant will be using 1.5 million. And then for school lunch, we'll, um, we're looking to use about 150,000. So a total offset amount of $6.6 .6 million. And then we have our appropriation breakdown. And again, this, this is broken down and I'm not going through all the detail that we had gone through the past two meetings, uh, you know, because I feel as though we've kind of talked through those, but you know, our salaries and stipends, you know, we're looking at about a 2.6% increase. Our benefits and insurance is going up close to $1.9 million. And that's primarily due to the fact that we have an increase uh, uh, in terms of our overall um, health insurance uh, amount. Our instructional support, we are you know, lowering that a little bit. Our operations and maintenance has increased um, slightly. Pupil services has remained the same. Special ed tuitions uh, we're able to bring down a little bit. And then we have our other operating costs. Again, that's going to go up approximately $550,000. Transportation, that's um, being lowered. Um, by about $776,000. Then our debt service is coming down 
about $113,000. So the total amount um, between uh, FY21 and FY22, uh, the difference is almost $3 million or the 2.88% increase. On the revenue side, we have our local revenues. And again, these are going to be shown as reductions to the town assessments. So what we've done is that we have our Medicaid reimbursement. We've increased that from 450 to 575. Um, we've had some more information come back to us. Uh, we're looking for um, outstanding claims by service providers, and we're probably going to get more reimbursements for our transportation settlement payments uh, that we that we've uh, we'll, we'll be getting. Miscellaneous revenue increased from 225 um, or from 200 to 225. And part of that is reimbursement for our transporta transporting Devereaux students. And it's projections based upon our receipts um, through December, 2020. And then finally, we're increasing our excess and deficiency up to $750,000 from $450,000. And part of that is due to the fact that we, are, we still have FY20 transportation settlement money on the bottom line this year that we have to use. So we're, we're putting that and we're combining that with uh, the 450 to come up with 750 in terms of the overall amount that we would use for excess and deficiency uh, to help with the town assessments. These are our state and local revenues all together. And as you can see, our chapter 70 and our chapter 71 transportation, both of those um, are down almost a combined um, 900 or almost a million dollars. Um, when we're looking at our chapter 70 charter aid, that's up about $44,000. So our, our total, total state aid is down 2.84% from 21 to 22. In terms of our, our um, Medicaid interest miscellaneous revenue and excess and deficiency, um, <clears throat> we have a total of about $900,000 in terms of a difference between FY21 and 22. So we're going from $700,000 to $1.6 million. And total revenues for the towns, the way it's broken down, um, we were able to get the total amount, again, down to 2.8. And again, that doesn't necessarily tie back to each particular town. So for example, Holden is going up 1.6 million or about 5.3%. Paxson, 376,000 or about 5.5%. Princeton, 88,000, 1.7%. Rutland, 639,000, about 4.8%. And Sterling, 174,000, 1.4%. So the total for the town is 4.29%, almost 4.3% as um, for an increase uh, or a total of $2.9 million. Again, you can see with our state aid and with our local revenue, um, you're really looking at a total revenue dollar increase of $2.9 million. And then we have our budget calendar. We do know that Holden, um, Princeton, Rutland, and Sterling have all set their town meetings. Paxton had a town meeting set for May 3rd. They're looking to probably modify that and change that date. Um, and we're hopeful that we're going to be getting that, that time frame soon. And that is it for our presentation on the budget. Thank you. So with that, I would entertain a motion to, I'm gonna need some, um, I need to take a look here, keep me straight on the numbers because the numbers are not the same as they are in the agenda. So I would entertain a motion to approve the fiscal year 22 appropriation of $105,053,279 with assessments to the member towns as follows. Thirty-three million three hundred and thirty-three million three hundred and twenty-eight thousand four hundred and thirty-seven dollars to Holden, packs in the amount of seven million two hundred and twenty thousand six hundred and four dollars, Princeton in the amount of five million two hundred and seventy-two thousand six hundred and twenty-one dollars, Rutland in the amount of thirteen million eight hundred and thirty-eight thousand three hundred and twenty-five dollars, Sterling in the amount of twelve million two hundred and sixty-three thousand six hundred and fifty-three dollars. Is there a motion so to so moved. Second. Thanks. So I think I had I think I had Ben and then Bob. We'll go with that. All right, motion's been made, it's been seconded. We'll open the floor for questions or comments.
All right. Let's start with Adam. Can't believe I was the first one in there. I thought it was slow. Um, I just one basic question off the top. Um, so how much does the how much is remaining in excess and deficiency after the 750k comes out? So through the chair, what we've done is we have a balance from FY20 that um, is going to be brought forward into 21. Um, the the balance from FY20, uh, the this was the encumbrance on on the um, readiness payments uh, to the two transportation providers. We've made one payment. There's a balance there of approximately three hundred fifty thousand dollars. We are very close uh, on making um, a settlement uh, for the second provider. Those dollars hit our bottom line in 21 before we even touch FY 21. So we're looking at approximately 500,000 before we touch FY 21. The, the balance in FY 20 that was certified this past December was approximately 1.4 million. Okay, thank you. Uh, Linda long -Bleal. I guess, can you explain how you're able to reduce instructional support? How are you, what, what did you cut from what we discussed last week? And also, I have the same question with respect to special ed tuitions. Um, through the chair, uh, we used uh, for instructional support uh, $250,000 in, in circuit breaker to offset uh, the cost for special education contract services. We used $250,000 uh, to offset the costs uh, for the special education services so that that line item gets reduced and it gets um, made up for but with circuit breaker funds um, but I didn't understand your comment yes. about instructional support I didn't get that I'm sorry Linda that is turn. that is in instructional support that's one of the oh, categories okay. that's in instructional support so that oh, broad okay. category includes that your other question though I think needs to be answered if you could repeat that Oh, my question, I had the same question about instructional support and, and special ed tuitions. My understanding was that special ed tuitions were reduced, um, and I wanted to know how that occurred. What, what did we cut? Through, through the chair, again, um, and, and for the full committee, um, the, the total cost for special ed tuitions as of now is approximately $7.2 million of the total cost, mm -hmm. but where we're allocating uh, approximately 1.5 to our FY22 to 40 grant. Um, we're allocating approximately 1.2 in circuit breaker carry fall from FY21 mm -hmm. and um, approximately, uh, I'm sorry, 1.5. And um, for FY22 circuit breaker, we're estimating that reimbursement at approximately 2.5. So the net, the, the, the mm -hmm. net to, to the general fund is what you're seeing there. Okay, right. thank you. Okay, I have uh, Mike Pantos. Uh, my question would be, how much um, of the trans transportation stabilization fund is being used in this budget? And out is what number is that out of how much available? So through the chair, we're using approximately $1 million um, for FY22. In terms of how much is available, uh, approximately 1.2, 1.3. And uh, it was my recommendation to the superintendent that we, we keep at approximately a million dollars. All right. Thank All right. you for doing that. Thank you. Bob? So I really have two questions. Uh, other operating costs are substantially up in terms of percentage. And I'm wondering what's driving that. And then the second question is why such a dramatic decrease in, in uh, transportation for uh, chapter 71 funds from the state. So through the chair for other operating costs, and, and we've talked about this at previous meetings, um, the Wachusett budget for FY21 was approved in March 9th of uh, 2020. It was before the state's FY21 budget was finalized um, in late December of, of 20. Uh, thus, there, there is a gap 
between um, the FY21 Wachusett approved budget and the final state budget approved in, in late December of, uh, of, of 20. Um, and again, these figures are taken directly from the state cherry sheet. If you look, if you look at the approved FY21 state budget in the initial FY22 uh, state budget on, on the cherry sheet, you'll see that there's a variance there of probably 17 or $18,000. The gap is not as great. Um, if you look at the final um, state budget for 21 and, and the initial governor's uh, budget for, for 22. I'm sorry, Bob, I apologize. Your other question, please. Uh, sure. Thank you for that. And so why why such a dramatic decrease in uh, transportation funds for the upcoming year, the Chapter 71 funds? And through the chair, again, we're using approximately a million dollars to to offset uh, uh, those costs uh, in FY22. And uh, those million dollars have been used to also offset the transportation assessment uh, for the towns as well. Thank you. I have Matt next. I have a couple of questions. Um, it sounded like E&D increased by 300,000 and uh, was that all due to the trans transportation settlement? Through, through the chair, uh, yes it is Matt. And uh, again, there there is one other settlement, one other contract that we're looking to settle fairly soon, and we're getting really, really close. And, and so that number, uh, there'll be uh, an addition uh, to that number. At the end of the day, the remaining dollars from those FY20 carry forward dollars hit our bottom line for FY21. So it sounded like the transportation settlement has to be used in its entirety. If we use 300,000, do we have an estimate as to what would be left in that? In terms of the balance for FY20? Yes. Um, there, there is a, a number out there. I'm just a little bit uncomfortable because we're still in the process of negotiating a settlement, Matt. That, that's all that I'm saying. Bob? You, we can't discuss that, that number here, guys. We can't. So uh, just to follow up, how did, uh, I guess a different way of asking a question is, how did we determine the 300,000? Was that because it was the settlement that we've already agreed to? Yes, it is. Through the chair, yes, it is. That's the, we, that's the balance left over from the, um, the encumbrance and the payment to AA Transportation about a month ago. So that's 100% of the balance left. Yes. As of now, yes. Yeah. What I, so, and I just want to comment, and the reason why I was asking that is, um, I think Member Pantos had asked a question on the transportation stabilization, and it sounded like there might have been two to th 1.2 million or so that the superintendent recommended to utilize 1 million. My concern is not the budget as a whole, Dr. McCall. My concern is the assessment to the to the individual towns, specifically to Rutland. And I think that the impacts of this assessment will um, be devastating to town and to town services. And I know that um, the town has done a good job of sharing that information. So my, my hope is that if, if there's an opportunity or a way to reduce those assessments further without impacting the budget in terms of what we're providing for services, I, I, I'd i like to see if those opportunities do exist. And that's why I was asking the question specifically on on the E&D and on the transportation stabilization. Thank you, Matt. Just. Um you know, I, I think it might be worth clarifying for uh, people on, on this call and in this meeting that when Adam asked the question about, you know, how much e d would we have left, right now, and, and Dan and, and others keep me honest, right now we have 1.4 million certified in e &D. Um, I understand it's, there's, it's the administration's recommendation to put forward 750k of that 1.4 million 
to bring down the assessments to the towns in this budget with the understanding that at least 300K, perhaps more, will be available at the end of this fiscal year and available to be certified in the next time we certify for E and D. Dan That's and, correct, and Mike. Am I stating that correctly and clearly? Yes, you are. Thank you. All right, I got Malia. Okay. Um, I guess my first question was about the transportation. I think you just clarified some of it, but when I was looking at the transportation numbers, is it not also true that some of that decrease is due to the numbers and the drop of enrollment and how that's calculated, um, or a big chunk of it actually? So I have a concern in the back of my head um, that if our students are returning in the numbers we would hope them to, um, that that is one area where the state using the counts from this year versus last year may be impacting our budget significantly and may change between now and town meetings um, or whatever. That's beyond our control, but I wanted to make sure that I had that understand. My understanding was correct, that that is also a very big factor in why our transportation is less because we spent less this past this year. Therefore, we have less in our starting bucket for reimbursement. Is that correct? I see yes. nodding. Yes. Okay. So that is one, that leads to my second question. So that is one area where theoretically, if the state were to change how they calculate things, that might impact our budget in some way, although who knows what they're going to be doing. Um, so my second question is more of a general question. Again, looking at how this falls I I think we've reduced a lot out of our budget, honestly. I mean, I would have liked to have seen the revised line item budget to ascertain that, um, but I think we have. But my concern is that because of the way the state does their figures and because of the way the minimum local contribution starts and because we've gotten home harmless, which actually hurts some of our towns, we end up with at least two of our towns, and I think three of them actually going up and two of them substantially. And so I'm still concerned by the impact on those towns. So I guess my question is that knowing we can't, a lot of this is beyond our control, but what things in the budget are areas like transportation where the state may, that might be impacted by things beyond our control that the state's talking about, such as numbers of enrollment changing um, or other things that we don't, you know, I don't, I don't have a whole list in front of me. I've seen a lot of things talked about but I'm, I'm curious just so we have an understanding of what, what, how much this might change going forward. I know the House and yeah. the Senate will change their numbers and who knows when that will happen, hopefully on time this year. I know transportation is one area. I know if they decide to throw it all out and use the counts from last year, that will actually impact our assessments quite a bit, actually. Um, who knows? I don't know what discussions are going on around that. But are there other things other than those things that we were not aware of that might ultimately affect this? And if they happened in a timely manner, we could then lower our assessments at the town meetings if they happened in time, theoretically. So I guess your question is, you know, is there a possibility that some of the state funding could be could change? Definitely. And yeah, we don't, I guess I'm just making sure I'm not missing things. Those are the things that I'm aware of yeah. off the top of my head. But as far as you guys are concerned, who've spent a lot, I mean, obviously I've spent a lot of time, but you've spent more time on the state level with what's going on. Are there other things that are being discussed that might impact this? Or be considering half our committee wasn't here last year for this process, what other pieces might change that will impact the assessments? between now and the town meetings that we we obviously can't control, but what might? So uh, again, what we've seen right now, so for new members, you know, we have the governor's budget. So the governor's budget came out at the end, you know, the end of January. So that's really what we have to base our numbers on in terms of moving forward. You know, we have our cherry sheet numbers uh, through that. So that's how we create our budget. That's how we, that's our starting point. How it then gets modified after that is based upon what happens uh, when it goes through the whole process. So as we've kind of, you know, we end up kind of moving, you know, around back and forth as, you know, maybe more chapter 70 comes in, maybe less transportation money comes in. There's a, a push pull that goes on as we kind of go through this process. Um, it's it's not a um, hard science. It, it is, but it isn't in terms of our projections because we really are at the whim 
of um, it, the the state government and what they finally decide upon for either um, regional transportation reimbursement, circuit breaker reimbursement, um, uh, chapter seventy, chapter seventy one. Uh, you know, all of those items come into play as we as we kind of go through this process and move forward. Dan, did you want to add anything to that? So um, pretty much spot on, Daryl. Um, again, there, there there may be an adjustment in, in the formula for Chapter 70, um, uh, maybe is the key word. Uh, regional Chapter 71, uh, regional transportation reimbursement, uh, again, uh, yeah, we'll probably see a tweak in that um, given the, the amendment that, that I'll, I'm, I'm filing um, in our FY20 amended uh, EOR. Um, in, in Chatter Aid, you, you might see a, a tweak there, but uh, those amended numbers will really drive how we then look at the bigger picture, um, perhaps sometime in mid, mid to, to late April of, of this spring. Thank you for that. I appreciate that. Do you have any estimate? You mentioned the ER. Do you have any estimate of what that may result to us? No. For 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 chapter uh, well, the, the adjustment I, uh, Malaya, that you're working on. I'm sorry. The amendment that you're working on. So what what I can share with the committee um, is no, I don't have an estimate, but um, I, I do have assurance, um, as I uh, had spoken to to legal um, and I think to finance as well, that that uh, that payment will have a positive impact probably in the second disbursement of regional transportation um, this spring. Um, I asked the question point blank um, and uh, Desi was un unwilling to uh, give me a definitive answer because because uh, they they were still waiting um, on on EOs uh, from from other districts. I mean here we are uh, the middle of March and we still don't have our, our first disbursement of chapter 71 um, and um, uh, typically we would have received that uh, mid to late January at the latest. All right so that will then change our transportation numbers because next year's transportation is based on what we spent this year so that to will have chair. a positive impact hopefully. yes yes it will yep yep one impact I, I, I can't project. All right thank you. Thank you I've Ken next. Thanks. So in terms of, of tonight, yeah, I would have liked to have seen us be a little bit more aggressive with the ND to lower the to lower the town assessments, but um, but no amendments. Um, the uh, we, were, we are voting on both on two things tonight, right? We're voting on the overall budget number, the and then the individual town assessments. And you know, if we come into more money between now and May 5th or whatever the first one is, we can even amend on the floor to lower the assessments. We can't raise the budget, but we can always lower the lower the assessments. I did have a question, though, and it's it's going to seem opposite to my saying we should have been spending more E and D. Um, in terms of circuit breaker, you're saying next year your plan is to spend 1.5 million, give or take, in carry forward from 21 and 2.5 from your estimated 22 circuit breaker. What is the total circuit breaker that we had? What, what what do we spend in the circuit breaker this year? Is what I'm saying. Like, I want to make sure we're not building a structural deficit in the way we're using circuit breaker, right? So, so if you're going to use 2.5 of next year's money in circuit breaker next year, which was your 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 round number, what do you think your total circuit breaker estimate is for next year? Will you have another 1.5 left, or is it like four, and you're going to have 1.5 left for next year, or or how does that? If you see my question. So through the chair, our estimated reimbursement this year is almost 3.3 million, 3 million, 291,060 $291, dollars. Um, we should have a, a, a definitive number in terms of what our, um, for the larger group, uh, in, in terms of what our potential net claims will be. Um, um, Director Smith is, is filing an application for what they call pothole money. What is that? Um, it's potential circuit breaker, circuit breaker reimbursement in the current fiscal year. We may not qualify, 
but if nothing else, we'll have a definitive number as to what our net claims will be for the circuit breaker process that she files in early July of 21. And with that number, let's just say it's $4 million, then we can then calculate, we can definitively calculate uh, what our potential reimbursements will be based upon 65%, 75% or, or, or more. So, and, and again, um, uh, the state is, 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 is spot on um, in terms of the reimbursement. So if we're looking to receive this year 3.3, we're gonna get 3.3 and a slight adjustment, slight adjustment um, in, in June. Um, Christine, did I miss anything? So, so to kind of boil that down, the, the, what, what I'm taking home from what you just said is that you, you don't have definitive numbers, but we're not spending all the circuit, you're not estimating spending all of next year's circuit breaker to the bone. Because my concern was, you know, you, that we seem like if you just listen to this conversation, we're raising the budget, you know, what, whatever that final number line is, but it's really a lot more than that, right? Uh, because of using what I will call one time money. And I just wanted to make sure all this one-time money wasn't really one-time money. Like the circuit breaker from the answer I heard doesn't super seem like it's one-time money. It seems like it's a revolving thing where you carry some forward and you use some and we're, we're it, it's probably a little bit more aggressive than usual, but it's somewhat steady state is, 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 is what, I, what I'm hearing. And when they do the transportation in circuit breaker, that might help, you know, down next year as, as well. Um, but you know some of the using the reach the stabilization from regional transportation i just want us to as a committee be aware to some degree we are doing what our towns have been doing in the past few years we're using it seems like we're using a little bit of one-time money to offset an increase uh if we have the same increase next year we may be trouble right so so we probably shouldn't be thinking about what we're adding next year we're going to have it the best we can to just kind of like stay steady um in, with, with in, the way we seem to be proceeding. And Ken, to, to your point, uh, again, we're, we're using, excuse me, um, we're estimating a 2.5 next year for, for 22 circuit breaker, but I'm still leaving a buffer there for approximately 800,000 and change. Um, and to use my term, as we've so often said, a fluid number, uh, but a buffer of about $800,000 between the estimated expenditure and uh, this, this year's uh, receipts. Um, and uh, um, again, um, Director Smith can, can tell you exactly, but I'm not aware of her losing any students that will, that will hugely impact uh, circuit breaker claim for, for FY22. Fair to say, Christine? Chris? That's correct. That's correct. And then if all the students come back too, we have to worry about sure we have money to, to educate them next year, you know, the ones that left this year. So I'm just saying we, we don't, we just want to make sure we're not building using too much one-time money. Exactly. I'll stop saying that over and over. And, and, and we hear exactly what you're saying, Ken. Uh, you know, that's one of the reasons why we are looking to hold on to a, a reasonable amount of excess and deficiency, because again, that could carry over into next year. And if we need to tap into that again next year, it might be something that we have to. Thank you. So I had a couple questions. Um, the first is I, I want to differentiate between offsets and, and carry forward funds, carry forward funds being one of the types of offsets. So when we reviewed the budget on March 8th, um, you would, uh, the administration estimated that we were carrying forward 2.4 million in funds from fiscal year 20 to fiscal year 21. Um, you've presented tonight that you've increased the transportation revolving or the transportation carry forward number by 650,000. Um, so a little over $3 million now in, in carry forward. However, the um, budget number was only reduced by $150,000. So can you help me uh, square up the difference between the 650 and the 150? We've added 650,000 in transportation, but we've only reduced the budget by 150,000. So, I believe Dan, you sent me a note that you may have taken or you may have re reduced the amount of school choice. That's correct. So yes. one thing that we did, Mike, thank you. Um, 
we we added back in benefits and insurance we added back two hundred and fifty thousand dollars we were using uh, approximately two hundred fifty thousand dollars originally to offset the cost uh, uh, for, for insurance and so we took that out um, secondly um, we we bumped up um, we, we bumped up our, our circuit breaker I think uh, originally the number back on um, February 22nd um, I have here uh, was uh, 1.2 uh, we're now at 1.5, so that's an increase uh, of 300,000. Um, back on February 22nd um, for FY22 circuit breaker, we we were looking at approximately 2.2, and, and now we're at almost uh, uh, 2.5. Um, transportation stabilization. Um, uh, again, um, we're looking at a, um, a, a a total figure of uh, of a million dollars. Um, and uh, we, we bumped up, um, originally we were using approximately 1.4 in our 240 grant, and um, now we're looking at approximately 1.5, so another $100,000 there um, in, in the 240 grant. So, so again, just going back to the last budget that was presented, um, you know, we've said that we've increased transportation, but it looks like we've made some reductions in other areas so that the net, um, uh, perhaps in, in carry forward was 150K, not 650K. It was 650K in transportation, but not in terms of the overall all trans carryover number of terms of funds bringing, coming from fiscal 20 to fiscal 21. Correct? Okay. So next question for Daryl. Um, you know, we've, I, I know that you've reported back to this committee that we've received feedback from a number of towns um, that uh, had some real concerns about our, our numbers, a couple different iterations of it. Um, for at least three of those towns, does the new um, uh, appropriate assessment numbers allay in your mind? Do they allay their concerns? Do you think they're still going to have a problem with these levels? I think it's going to be close, uh, Mike, you know, as we kind of look at these overall numbers. I know Rutland had originally said, boy, we'd, we'd really like a $700,000 $700, number, and then the assessment came in higher from Monty Tech. So then the town manager said, no, 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 we're actually going to have to put that toward Monty Tech. It, it can't come out of uh, Wachusett. So it's going to have to come out of Wachusett, excuse me. So he wanted it around five hundred. Town of Holden, I, I think they're uh, they're close. Um, I've talked to the town of Paxton. I think they're they're uh, in a better position um, than they were even. Uh, gosh, when we first started off, um, I, I feel like they're pretty good. Uh, Princeton and Paxton. Um, I, I'm, I'm sorry. Yeah, Princeton and Paxton. Uh, those numbers are, I think, you know, and I'm not going to say low enough because uh, you know, an increase is an increase, uh, but. Uh, they're, I believe they're doable for those those communities as well. I think you know we we might have some communities uh, push back a little bit with this, uh, but again, you know when when you look at the overall increases compared to those of last year, they're much lower than they were last year. Um, and uh, you know I feel as though we've really put a lot of money, as <clears throat> Dan mentioned and Mike, as you mentioned, back into this um, in order to lower the assessments and bring their overall dollar amount down while we're still maintaining our staff, keeping going, you know, we're, you know, we have to keep going with what we're doing. We don't know what we're going to face in terms of the kids uh, learning loss, you know, in, you know, over the summer, next year, into the following year. So we really want to be careful with, with how, how low we go. Okay. Christina Smith, can I ask you to take the virtual gavel for a moment? Yes. I want to. Um, I want to make a comment, and I want to make sure that it's as a member and, and not seeing us through the chair. I just want to be very clear about that. Okay. Um, thank you. So, so the comment is this: um, I'm having trouble supporting the budget for for this reason, um, and the reason is, I believe and this is a very unusual time, but we've had a fully supported uh, budget in fiscal twenty one. Um, our state aid came in relatively as we expected it. Our ex expenses for covid expenses were largely covered through grant funding. And I believe that we have, and I think that the administration has acknowledged that we have additional carry forward funds available that we can bring in to fiscal 22 to lower the overall um, assessments to the towns. And I would suggest that you even can even trade off 
bringing over more carry forward dollars um, and perhaps even lowering the amount of E&D that's applied. To me, it, u- utilizing E&D is, is almost the last option. Um, but I think that we've heard from at least three towns that the assessment levels that we're projecting even today are coming in quite a bit higher than, than what they've given us feedback on. And I think in this year and in these times, it's important that we have an ear towards that. So from my perspective, I, I think there's more that we can do in terms of carrying forward funds from fiscal year 21 to 22. Um, I'm a bit disappointed that we didn't carry over as much as we could have. And for me, I'm not, I don't feel that I can support the budget at this level. Thank you, Christina. You're welcome. Any other comments or questions? I have um, Michael, then Carl, and then Linda. I, um, just a comment. I'd like to speak. Uh, so I do believe Rutland was slightly, I'm under the impression that Rutland was slightly surprised because the uh, Bay Path vocational did come in $100,000, slightly higher than they expected. Um, and But this current budget as it stands right now will still devastate Rutland. Uh, there's been talks of having to lay off uh at least three full-time firefighters and uh that ultimately affects the schools uh with responding to emergencies and such so i very hard call for rutland to be able to support this budget thank you carl so question i guess kind of this is for administration at least and i mean it's kind of a broad question that these people can ball over as well um so Building off of uh, what Chair Dennis had mentioned in terms of keeping the, like, if we keep the top line of our budget the same, but try and utilize other resources to upfront to lower the assessments to the towns, uh, which incurs a little bit more financial risk for us as a district, like if we tap the and a little bit more. However, do we have a sense in terms of how much we might be extended vice how much we might be getting down the road from the federal legislation that has just recently passed that there's some money that's going to be working its way through to schools from that point and so if because if we pass our budget and everything's set in stone and then in august we get money from the federal government we can't raise our budget but we can uh adjust assessments or it can be something that could carry over to the bottom line so to kind of replenish the ND for the next year but my question is is that um kind of what is your sense for like how much or do you have a sense for like how much more we could potentially lower the assessments knowing that there is going to be some additional funding from the federal government coming to us at some point down the road So, uh, Carl, basically what I've been told from by Desi, um, Bill Bell at Desi, we had a conference call with uh, the commissioner and a couple of other members of his um, uh, cabinet. Basically, a two and a half times the ESSER amount, or our ESSER one amount, I believe, which would give us about $450,000 uh, in terms of uh, new stimulus money. Uh, it, you know, and again, Commute, towns will get this money. Ta- so the stimulus money is $1.5 trillion. So yeah, schools get money, but towns are going to get money as well. Um, municipalities get money. Um, cities are going to get money. So they're, they're separating the two. So that's one thing we just need to remember is that education is not the only benef- benef- um, benefactory or um, benefactor of this. You know, We're actually going to be in a situation where we're, we will be seeing um, a decent amount. The issue that we have, and this is something that they did bring up, is that it's based, and I believe I've talked to you about this, it's based upon Title I. That's how they're planning on doing the um, rollout in terms of the funds. If it wasn't based on Title I and was based purely on like the number of students you have, um, we would see much more money. Um, so that's one of our issues. Uh, that's why we're seeing such a, a low dollar amount. Um, your second question around, gosh, you know, could we tap into other things? 
there are definitely ways to lower the, there's all, I, how long have we been doing this? And many of you have been sitting around this table for a long time. There are ways to lower the budget, definitely. But then we have to start thinking about, okay, what what will that do next year for us? How how might we be in a situation where we we are in need of some more funds for something that we weren't able to project out? And that's really, again, what we might be looking at. Excess and deficiency, one thing people need to understand is, I can't use that, we can't use that as uh, a savings account. We don't have access to those funds. So when something goes to the bottom line and goes into excess and deficiency, the only way that we can use those funds, um, there are two ways. One, if the towns vote to support us using them for something. So school committee makes a vote, they have to approve it at a town meeting uh, within 45 days. Or if it's the end of the year and we're in the red, then that they will actually take money out of excess and deficiency to make up the difference. Those are the two ways in which those funds can be used. I have uh, Linda Long Uh Yes, um, you may have mentioned this, and my apologies if I missed it. Um, but how much more uh, potential carry forward money do we have? Dan, uh, potential carry forward money, Linda? Yeah, yeah, more or less. So through the chair, um, <clears throat> by making the adjustment in, in school choice, uh, we, we, we've backed that out um, where potentially a little bit under a little bit under 700,000 in, in school choice uh, mm -hmm. um, that uh, uh, we could be bringing forward. Uh, mm -hmm. We brought forward last year 372,000. Um, mm -hmm. where we're looking to bring forward this year's uh, um, allocation. I have it here someplace, it's 300,000 and change. So mm -hmm. just round numbers, top of my head, 672,000 plus uh, mm -hmm. that we could potentially uh, bring forward now that we've uh, backed out the 250. And just as a reminder, um, we, didn't, we didn't decide to bring that forward in this particular budget because so through the chair, we mm -hmm. we were we backed it out because we were looking to hold on to that for unanticipated um, mm -hmm. needs or services that that may not be covered either in the budget or through a grant. I mean, Daryl, mm -hmm. did I did I miss something there, Daryl? No, that's perfect. That's exactly okay. what it is. So Linda, okay, it's, it's it, 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 as I just explained in terms of excess and deficiency. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know when you when most school districts have school choice that money is not allocated year by year by year into something. Right. So for years, we took the million dollars. So at one time we had over a million dollars coming into us from school choice. It would mm -hmm. go into our uh, health insurance. It would help pay for our health insurance. Mm -hmm. uh, and as our numbers have come down right now, we get a, a little over $300,000. Um, we're, we're looking at that saying that gives us a little bit of money to help us if there is a situation like a 9C cut or something else that we can't project out right now. We don't know right. what's going to happen in 22. Right, right. Okay, and so then just following up on that, just a, a comment, which is that, um, you know, this budget, I think you've done a lot to try to reduce the budget already um, and try to meet the towns uh, where where they uh, are. And um, rep Member Mills makes the good point that if we need to, we can always lower the amount on the floor when we have more information about additional funding. And so I think I think there isn't a need right now to um, to negotiate against ourselves and and lower the budget more. I think we can if need be, we can do that on the floor. So that's so I'm inclined to support this budget. I think it's enough of a cut already. Um, it's a much lower increase than we've um, than the typical four percent that we've um, increased in previous in recent years. So. Thank you. I have uh, Laura and then Bob and then Malia. Thank you. Um, question: You mentioned, um, Dr. McCall. You mentioned Title One. Um, being a factor in in the funding that could come from the COVID re relief bill. I, am I hearing you correctly that there will be restrictions to how we can use that money? I'm, I'm sorry, Lynn. I, I, Laura, I, I didn't explain it correctly. So they use the Title I formula in terms of how the money is distributed. So it does. it's not going to have the same restraints as Title I. 
I, I believe the the funds will be a little more flexible, much more flexible than than Title One grant funds. Uh, those are ex uh, just um, <laughs> very very structured in terms of how uh, the grant works now than than how it used to be. So no, it it's it, it's not it's it's not the same type of thing. It's just purely based upon the the Title One um, socioeconomic status of the uh, of the district. That's how the breakdown works in terms of free and reduced lunch students and all, all of those things. So I'm hearing that, that that will determine the amount of money that we potentially receive from yes. the COVID relief, but it will yep. not have the same restrictions as the Title I. And in my understanding that there won't be restrictions placed on how we could utilize that money? Yeah. So again, they've not come out directly. I've, I've, I, we have nothing from Desi at, at this stage of the game that says what we probably cannot spend it on. I'm sure there will be some restrictions. I, I would, um, what they would, what they've already suggested is that you do not put this into people, um, because again, it's it's a one-time um, one-time funding source. So you wouldn't be able to carry it over from year to year. So again, as soon as we get more information, it, we'll make sure that gets out to everyone. And Dr. McCall, I, I believe we have to spend some of this money on uh, extended school day or school year, those types of programs as well. So there are Thank some you. restrictions already that are out there. Thank you. 20%, and that, that is something, Laura, that was in the in the law, 20% um, of the funds that are um, shared with a community or a um, district have to be spent on uh, some type of remedial program, after school pro program, summer program. Um, whatever it might be. Thank you, uh, Bob, next. So I'm gonna support this budget. I think I think we have made significant efforts to try to um, limit the impact on towns. We, we can't obviously um, go up later if we have more money. We can always go down and amend it. And and I think it's it's best to be cautious, um, and and just as a big picture, going from sixty thousand feet, we have a woefully underfunded education budget as a district, and have for many many years. We need to beef up administration. It's it's you know it, unbelievably uh, low in terms of the state uh, for our central office. Um, we still don't have full-time counselors and, and in our schools. There's a need for that. Um, again, if, if we had a, a robust staffing plan, um, we, we desperately need many more teachers in our schools. And yes, there's a facilities issue there too, um, but w that needs to be addressed as well. So uh, uh, the vocational program needs to be established and that'll pay for itself once it is, but but it needs to to, to occur. Um, so we, we have tremendous needs, and and to go and and have a strategy that says, oh, well, let's go and and use more uh, E and D or something else like that. I think it sets us up for disaster. And um, why would we do that? I think that there's potentially funds that that uh, it's likely there will be significant funds that will come both to the towns themselves and and some funds that will come to the district directly and and if we can offset a little more well that's great but again we ought to be looking out and doing what we need to do for our district and and you know i'm going to be gone at, and in may but but this is a fight that that i've been sort of the entire time i've been on the committee it's been a real problem and and you know we've been tremendously underfunded and to sort of you know back off and say oh let's get the towns down even more it's it seems tremendously ill-advised and and the timing is wrong and we're better off with a larger number and if we if we can again sort of if there's a real need to sort of offset to towns we can do that later but we we need funds we, we desperately need funds as a district. And, you know, we have made gains in terms of, of textbooks and we've made some gains in terms of, of technology, significant gains. Um, 
but we're still way behind in terms of most districts in the Commonwealth and, and what our towns really deserve. I mean, we ought to be funding at a level that's um, well above average, not at the very bottom of the state. And, and, and so, you know, to, to, to turn around and, and not fund this budget seems terribly misguided. I, you know, I think we've made due diligence in terms of, of being responsible to towns to get it down and, and take what funds we have and use those wisely. So I, I'm going to vote for it. And I think any other way to approach it really would be irresponsible. It's not, it's not doing justice to the students. And they're our first responsibility. Thanks. Thank you, Amalia. OK. Um, I have a couple th more things have come up. Um, I guess my first is that I noticed, I do think this is still problematic for Holden, but I am conflicted because one thing I noticed is that even with the most recent decrease, it was only, it was less than 1%. It was less than a half percent. The Holden assessments went up when you did that. So there are factors that, you know, we can keep reducing, but there are some factors that because of the pieces of this that are out of our control and the way the percentage of students work out are still going to be really high, unfortunately. And I'm highly conflicted by that because obviously I represent Holden and I'd like them to pass this and I understand their concerns. Um, but when we've, in the most recent reduction, Holden still went up a smidge. It was like one tenth of a percent or something like that. Um, and it's it's frustrating for me to see that, but I think some of that is beyond us, which is why I, I keep trying to figure out those pieces that are influencing that, that are beyond us. Because I think it's really important for the public to understand. Um, and it's frustrating when we reduce and reduce and reduce and it's still five and six, five percent. Um, I don't know what we do with that, but they they have, you know, our town has almost half the student population. So some of that is beyond our control, but it's very frustrating because I know that we've reduced this and reduced this. Um, I have, um, so I, I wish I knew and could explain in more detail exactly what was causing that to happen so we could explain it to the public. <laughs> um, I have um, a couple other questions. I know... I believe at one point you indicated that the ESSER two funds were taken into account in these assessments. Is that still the case? And have the towns all indicated that they plan to use that option or have any of the towns indicated that they do not plan to use that option? <clears throat> so through the chair, uh, we did, uh, and, and for the larger group, uh, the, the governor's house one budget uh, states that uh, districts, regional districts uh, may use, and there's a calculation here, may use a portion of the rest of two funds to, to offset uh, the increase. So just very quickly across the board, uh, for Holden, the amount that was used was $207,782, uh, PACs and 47,494, uh, zero for Princeton, Rutland, um, 77,624 and for Sterling, $2,561. So that's already factored in and the towns have indicated they plan to utilize that. Uh, through the chair, we, we did receive notification, uh, written notification from Holden, uh, verbal uh, commitment from Rutland. Um, I, I can't speak to the other towns. Darrell, do you wanna jump in there? Uh, no firm commitment one way or the other, Malay, on those. Okay. But that would be my... The, the biggest ones are Holden and Rutland. For exactly. Our, when, you, when you add it all together for context, which I did from the state site, it's something like $400,000 out of our $600,000 we got from the answer two grants is allocated to this amount. So it, it's a big chunk. On paper, it looks like we got a lot of money, but when you factor this in, it, it's, it's a big chunk out of our budget when you put it all together. So... Um, so I appreciate that. I just wanted to make sure that was already reflected and that they actually were planning to use it. So, so through um, the chair, the, the, the value across the board is $335,461, 335,461. Thank you for that. I didn't have it in front of me, but thank you for that. Um, still a big chunk though. Um, so I appreciate that. And I guess my last comment is just that, well, I a question for later and a comment. I worry about using things like school choice because as we've said before, um, that is a dwindling um, portion of money. And I, I appreciate if it is a 
couple hundred thousand dollars. I, I appreciate having that because there may be things um, like we don't know if the governor will put further restrictions on the next round of ESSER funds or whatever they call them. That was a surprise thing. Um, it still helps our towns. It's, you know, doesn't really matter what pot of money those funds are in, but we don't know what they plan to do. They, they change their mind often. So I guess in some ways I appreciate having a tiny, tiny bit of wiggle room, knowing that our school choice students are also reducing greatly. Um, so that's my comment on that. And then my last question is when you referred to Title I being the basis for the grants and the free and reduced lunch students being part of that, um, it does raise just a curiosity question. This year, Universal, we had Universal free lunch. So do we know if other families, have those numbers been changing? Have they gone up? Have families actually been registering for free and reduced lunch this year since they don't really have to? And is that um, something maybe just to keep an eye on? Because I, I, I suspect more families would have been eligible this year had they had to actually register, but they, they didn't really. So. Yeah, they don't have to. And again, those numbers will not come into play with uh, this, this, this stimulus money this year. Okay. So uh, again, they're going to have to take a look at how that plays out because that's everywhere. Right. I, I was just, when you mentioned that it was based on lunch, I said, well, that's an interesting question because I suspect that there are anecdotally quite a few families that might have registered had they been required to this year, but didn't because it wasn't necessary to get the free and reduced lunch or because they're not in the school building. So um, just something to keep an eye on. Thank you. Through, through the chair, um, I have a number here. Uh, the, it, the figure for this year is 1% of the prior year uh, in terms of that uh, there. Okay. I have uh, Scott next. Hi, I would um, really hate to see the budget go lower. Um, I've been on the committee eight years and the towns, doesn't surprise me, they, they don't want uh, the budget to go higher, they want it always to go lower. Um, and it's kind of surprising, um, I'm paying more taxes here in Holden. I know all the real estate um, assessments in the five towns have gone up. And so um, I know They've lost a little money in meals tax here in Holden, but um, I guarantee it's uh, made up much more with the uh, increase in taxes. Um, but I am going to support this budget. Um, and my two cents is allow it to go to the townspeople, the five towns. If they vote it down, they vote it down. But um, I think it's our job is to put forward the best budget for the students of this district. Thank you. Any other comments or questions before we go to a vote? Seeing none, Randy, can you call the roll? Member Ayala? Ayala, yes. Member Bennett? Bennett, yes. Member Brown? Brown, yes. Member Gustafson? Yes. Member Haber? Haber, yes. Member Imber? Imber, yes. Member Knowlton? Knowlton, yes. Member Kirschenbaum? Kirschenbaum, yes. Member Longbelil? Longbelil, yes. Member Mills? Oops, I'm so sorry. Ma Member Lavoie? Lavoie, no. Member Mills? Mills, yes. Member Mitchell? Mitchell, yes. Member Otmar? Otmar, no. Member Pantos? Pantos, no. Member Shapiro? Shapiro, yes. Member Silva? Silva, no. Member Smith? Smith, yes. Member Sullivan? Sullivan, no. Member Williamson? Williamson, yes. Member Woodland? Woodland, yes. Yeah. Member Young? Young, yes. Chair Dennis? Dennis votes no. Can you give us a quick tally there? I think we have 15 at least. We have 16 yes and six no. Okay. 
All right, so the budget is, uh, as stated, has passed. Thank you for that. Next item on the agenda is an update on the return to school plan. We'll turn it over to uh, Daryl. Thank you, Chair Dennis. I'm just gonna present um, my screen again. I'll go back to uh, the presentation. And thank you. So again, in-person planning, we have spent uh, just a huge amount of time, yes, doing um, budget stuff, but also getting ready for uh, our students to return to school uh, at the K-8 level. And so um, right now, uh, you know, as, as we stand here today, all K-8 schools are going to be scheduled to reopen to full in-person learning on Monday, April 5th. Uh, as I talked to you about last week, a parent survey went out. Approximately 90% of the K students will intend in person. Uh, that's that's the number right now. So 10%, um, give or take a percentage, uh, will be, remain remote for the remainder of this year. About 60% of the students will be riding the bus as well. So what we're doing is we're um, you, you know progress. We're, we're planning to uh, continue to focus on the effective instruction for planning support for our remote students. Um, you know, we have started our conversations with our teachers union. We have started our conversations with our administrators you know, for several weeks now uh, on you know, how we're going to continue to support those students for the remaining uh, the few months of school uh, before we get into summer. Um, what we're also going to be doing is more information is going to come out around in-person and remote learning for all families later on this week. And we're ultimately going to be looking for families to finalize uh, their learning model and their transportation selection by Monday, March 22nd, because we need to make sure that we have uh, the opportunity to, you know, arrange our classrooms correctly uh, in terms of spacing and so forth, as well as our buses. We need to um, ensure that we have the proper um, bus schedules in play, and it does take at least a week to put those together. So again, I reviewed this with you um, last week, and this is just an update as to where where we are right now in reference to uh, the planning for the K-8 return. And as you can see, we've already um, completed much of the, the first, you know, let's say the third to a half of the um, tasks that we had um, in play. So this includes um, our meeting last week with you, uh, we've continued to do things where we had a um, head custodian meeting last week where we were able to review with them all the different items that they're going to be responsible for in the building. And that was, uh, you know, again, a it, second time we've had the opportunity to meet with our head custodians around returning students to school. And they've been absolutely phenomenal in terms of uh, their responsiveness to uh, just making sure they're going to do everything in their power to make it safe for everyone. Uh, we've uh, had another meeting with our building principals to talk about next steps. Uh, the nurses had their final training on Buy Next Now testing. Uh, Director Keenan and I had our task force meeting to gain feedback from stakeholders last week. We also met with our WREA leadership last Thursday afternoon to talk about the entire process. Uh, and then, you know, what we've, what we've started to do is have those conversations around you know, what type of modifications might we have to take into play or might have to come into play for uh, cohort C and how that might play out with staffing instruction and busing. We've had another meeting um, for our transportation vendor. Um, and again, I've sent out information uh, this past weekend, principals have shared information and there are some other things that we need to continue to do. Uh, we have had our board, of, we had our board of health meeting uh, this afternoon where we met with our boards of health and our school nurses to talk about where we're at as a community uh, in terms of uh, COVID-19 and um, how we're feeling about returning kids to school. They are um, feeling positive about this moving forward right now. And then we now have several other items that we will continue to have scheduled and are ongoing, including a town hall for Kate educators that I'll be holding uh, this e this Thursday afternoon from, I believe, uh, 4.15 to 5.30. Uh, don't quote me on that, but th that's what's in my head right now. We'll have some more transportation uh, updates and meetings uh, just to ensure that we have everything down, especially once we, we have uh, the, final, um, the final numbers for people deciding upon uh, whether or not they're going to stay remote, um, whether or not they're going to come to school, and if they're, they're eligible to take the bus. 
And again, all those different items are coming into play as we have um, staff meetings focused on in-person instruction. We'll have our school nurse meetings uh, that will continue to go on. And we'll have a final Board of Health meeting on the 29th uh, of, of March. Uh, we'll continue to meet with our, our school nurses and we'll have our final plan sent out with the first day of full K-8 uh, in-person learning occurring on the 5th. We also are continuing to plan our 9-12. And as you know, DESE has not come out with any recommendations around high school students at this time returning to full in-person. So again, we're trying to be ahead of this, uh, if at all possible. Um, I did talk to the commissioner on Friday and also the associate commissioner about how that might play out. And there's still no definitive time for this right now. So, uh, you know, that's still a wait and see from the state level, but we're trying to just be ahead of the game. And we've, you know, completed many of the different items that, you know, we've also talked about in our last uh, meeting. And these are the different items that we're now moving into this week and into next week, including, um, you know, conversations around what a 912 plan looks like. Uh, information that's going to go out around cohort C, uh, what we're looking at in terms of um, anticipated student shifts in, in class, not classes, but um, maybe schedules. Um, and then ultimately, you know, what the, the goal would be, would be to have uh, the students back on the 26th of April, which is a Monday. Again, there's no date as associated with uh, the state saying high school students have to be back. But as we've talked about this, you know, at least we'd be able to look at the process because I know it's something that um, high school students in particular are very much interested in getting back in, especially those juniors and seniors, if they have the opportunity to be in school for a little bit before they either graduate or they go off for summer vacation, that would be great. Um, and as Catherine mentioned, you know, there are 50, the 50 day countdown is already starting uh, for high school. So that's where we're at right now in terms of our uh, reopening plan and where we're at. And I feel like we're in a pre pretty good place. You know, ultimately we have um, our, uh, we're going to have our uh, vaccination, um, per, you know, site on the 17th, which is Wednesday at Naquag Elementary. We have over 700 uh, employees who've signed up for this. That'll be going on from about eight o'clock in the morning until three o'clock in the afternoon. So have a lot of volunteers helping out, uh, have a lot of uh, our school nurses will be involved in this the entire day. So it's just, I think it's really gonna be something that uh, is going to help everyone as we kind of go through this process of getting kids back into school. So we're, we're really excited about it. Uh, teachers are really excited about it and we're looking forward to this whole process. Thank you, Daryl. Uh, open the floor for questions and comments. I got um, Matt. Hi, Dr. McCall. Thank you for that presentation. Um, have we made a determination as to what the day will look like for kids? Are we going to have the hour back Monday, Tuesday, Thursday, Friday? Do we know what Wednesday is going to look like? Yeah, so Matt, the way the way it's going to work, we would have the hour back on those four days. We're looking at Wednesdays right now because, again, one of the things is we have to take we have to take this into consideration. This is something that Desi actually mentioned in their guidance that was sent out two weeks ago. Uh, what we're doing with with kids right now, where we have uh, students at home, and then you know, so teachers are working with students at home and uh, students in front of them. That's one of the recommendations they say moving forward with this because there could only be a handful of kids. We're looking at that carefully. We're looking at, at you know, at if there are other ways for to do this, but we also know there might be some planning time that's necessary for teachers to be able to do that. So that's why that Wednesday afternoon is still is still there and it's something that we're looking at. Um, other than that, schools have to have 25 hours of in-person learning. And this is the other part, the other part of the conversation that I had with uh, Commissioner Riley on Friday afternoon, uh, where we went through, you know, kind of what what the exact amount of time has to be for uh, in-person learning. And it's, it's 25 hours uh, in terms of in-person coming in. So we would still be able to get that in if we took the um, two, two and a half hours off, off of a Wednesday. Um, but again, we're looking at that carefully and Bob and I will be talking about that tomorrow. We wanted to get the budget stuff through uh, tonight and you know go through that process. And then this is really the next item on our agenda. Just a quick follow up on that. Um, I, I saw the timeline asking parents to make a decision by the 22nd, which is a week from today. When do you think for the community and for the teachers and for for us? 
Probably later this week, Matt. Actually, it has to. It'll definitely be later this week. That way, people can um, make a decision based upon that. Okay. Thank you, Linda Long Blue. And what is the current thinking about uh, the you, the kids who uh, are going to be remote, keeping their current teachers? So, uh, yeah, Linda, that's <coughs> current thinking. That's a strong possibility. But again, one of the things that we want to look at is uh, the option of if a teacher has 24 students in a second grade class and another teacher has 24 students in a second grade class, three are remote here, um, one's remote over here, we'd probably look at taking that one student from that one remote and bringing them into another classroom just so uh, they would have the capacity to be together. We're looking at how that would play out. It does require us to look at numbers and spacing and everything else like that right now. So it's, it, it is, that's the next item that's on our agenda. So when you say you would think about bringing them over, you, they would, you would combine them with the other three that are also remote into the same classroom with the teacher who's got the 23 or whatever um, in person or a separate group altogether? It would probably be the combined in person so that that way they would have, okay, so, and part of it comes down to looking at the numbers of kids in the classrooms. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's all uh, conjecture right now in terms of in, in how I'm explaining this, but ultimately what I'm looking at would be mm -hmm. having, you know, maybe a group of students that rather than one student uh, in the classroom where, I'm sorry, 20 kids in the classroom and one student that's remote, um, not sure how that would play out. And again, that's some, one of the things that we talked about with mm -hmm. the teachers uh, the other day. And uh, you know, if there's mm -hmm. a way for us to work around that, that's what we'd like to look at. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I mean, it just, it seems to me that the kids would, the child who's remote would benefit most from staying in their class than they would, from with their same teacher, then they would benefit from being with three other kids who are also in remote. I mean, that's my thought. What's your thinking about that? Well, it, and again, part of it comes down to the teacher and having mm -hmm. one student or having three or four students. So perhaps one of the things that could happen mm -hmm. is if they were to merge, because again, as we've talked mm -hmm. about this, um, mm -hmm. you know, there has to be some flexibility with how that works out with, with students that um, have to remain home for whatever reason. Right. So we would, so what we would do is just have that student you know, again, have the capacity to be there. The teacher could be working with three or four students. Mm -hmm. My concern is you might have some students that feel uncomfortable being the only one. Mm -hmm. Okay. Them, you know, yes, they're remote, but yeah, all but of their still, classes yeah. would be in person. So okay, it, all right, that's something helpful. we have to take into consideration. Okay, thank you for explaining that. Thank you. Thanks, Linda. That's a good question. Thank you. I have Mike Pentas. Thank you. Um, Dr. McCall, will the school committee be able to observe the meeting with educators for K through eight, the town hall? Not typically, Mike. Um, it's just a, a meeting with uh, the teachers union that we have open. I haven't even okay. I haven't thought about that. All right, thank you. Um, Melissa? Hi. Um Linda, Linda answered one of my questions, um, asked one of my questions, sorry. Um, the other one I was wondering about, will the remote model look similar to how it runs now, or is it gonna be different, a different amount of hours on face-to-face uh, -face with the teacher? I know it's in the planning right now, but. <laughs> it, 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 yeah, it's in the planning, Melissa. So I don't want to, I don't want to, you know, lock into something. So again, remember we had the 35 and 40 hour uh, requirements uh, based upon the commissioner's original move for um, SLT for student learning time. So one of the things we're looking at is that in reference to the 25 hours. So I think there's still the opportunity for us to, to get some more clarification on that, but we'd like it to look you know, as as similar to what it currently looks like now as possible in terms of the in terms of the time. I just kind of wary because I know right now there's only half the kids in each class. But once there's all the kids, I know it's going to take longer to get off the buses and sanitize. And yes, everything's yeah. going to be a lot more time. So I'm concerned with how much time the remote kids are actually going to have face to face with the teacher now. Right. Um, and then to mimic uh, Linda, I, 
switching teachers, um, you know, three months, you know, just about three months left to school. I'm concerned about that also if, you know, uh, they have a rapport with their teacher and I would, wouldn't, I would hate to see them with a different one, just a couple months left to go. Um, so yeah, I just really want to point that out. No, I hear you. And thanks so much. I am Malaya next. Um, couple things, but I saw Linda had a question related to that. Can I let Linda ask that? Mine's on a different topic. I it don't want a... to. I can do whatever you want. I just noticed <laughs> it was related, and mine's completely different. Yeah, Malaya, you have uh, you have the floor. Okay. All right. So um, one thing I wanted to ask about is I have heard discussions about snacks and mask breaks and possibly the lack thereof. Um, I'm sure that's a detail that you're still planning, but I've heard it from various um, groups of people in our community. So I'm curious if you could speak to where those discussions are, because it's a real, very real concern I'm hearing from families. Oh, completely. Um, and again, this is, I think, one of the issues that we're going to, that we're facing is how snack works um, and, uh, you know, how a mass break is going to work in terms of the spacing, because once you go down, as we've talked about from six and, you know, or five, four, three, you know, all the way to three, um, you have to make sure that that mask is on at all times. Uh, so mm -hmm. one of the things we're looking at is having students go out into the, uh, you know, either a pod or outside um, for, you know, during research or whatever it is to have um, the snack breaks that are kind of built into their day. So that's gonna look a little different in every single building. So for example, you have a building like um, Glenwood that has absolutely gigantic pods. So they have, you know, six classrooms, you know, around a pod that could feed in and say, okay, you know, kids are gonna go out and have their snack for 10 minutes in the pod, you know, classroom A and then classroom B will come in. So those are all, again, we have the larger kind of 40,000 view of that, but the 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 ground level view at the building level um, is, is going to look, look different. I know I, you know, when we talked to the teachers about this the other day, some of the teachers were like, I don't even know how we're gonna do snack. I, you know, snack's gonna be really tough. Yeah, snack, snack's gonna be tough. But again, I you know, I would hate to keep kids out of school because we can't get a snack in at, at you know ten in the morning. I understand that. I'm just relaying the concern, and I I hope that that might be included in some of the information you're sharing with them because I have heard a couple different things coming, and they've said it's come directly from their building. So they're hearing different things about what will be allowed or won't. And it's causing some concern. I know some people who've said they may change their mind based on if their first grader has to be in a mask with no snack break all day, they may change their mind. So it's just something I think we need to be providing to them before the final deadline so that they are clear on what their child's experience will be. Um, I was curious if the teachers had weighed in on the question you just raised about changing teachers, because I, I can see both sides of that, but I also, obviously we had concerns about that in October. And I have more concerns now that they built a community with their teachers, but I also understand the prospect of um, remote learners feeling like the only one in their class and that can have other effects. Um, have the teachers weighed in on what they think would be the best solution or have we asked them? So we started our conversation with them last Thursday. Uh, and again, we're, you know, I'll hold the, the town hall on, on this coming Thursday. So I'll, I'll probably hear a lot more about uh, you, know, you know, their thoughts or concerns or or maybe ideas about how that might work. So um, nothing definitive, Malaya. Okay. Um, and my, I have a process question and a topic question. Topical question, have we, I know you just talked about the testing we do have. Do we have any update on the process towards pool testing, which is the ultimate goal that we started on that path? Um, and when the DESI stops paying for the current testing, do we have a plan for how the pool testing is going to happen or if it is, or if we're just going to stick with what we have? Um, that's something I did not see reflected in your opening guideline. And I know the DESI and the current testing ends in I think mid-April. So what is the plan going forward for that? So we just ended up getting all the Binex testing the, in the entire process done as of the end of last week. So Director Keenan did have the opportunity to sit in on a pooled testing webinar uh, from DESI Friday afternoon. 
and we're going to be going through that tomorrow uh, and just kind of talking about uh, the process, how it would work, if it could work. Um, again, it's very labor intensive. So one of the things we're doing is we're reaching out to a few different places to see how it is working and what the expectations are, you know, especially from the community. I know, uh, you know, as we kind of go through this process uh, of getting kids back in, um, if there's a way for us to, you know, ensure that there's one more level of safety, that'd be great. Um, I'm, you know, again, it, it's kind of a, it, it's still up in the air in terms of the next step because we literally just finished the the Binax. Appreciate the update, though. I I did know because the commissioner, if you listen to him, it's happening in all schools for the rest of the no. year. So yeah. I really just wanted to clarify that. Um, it, where not even at. half the schools in the state are doing this right now. So it's. Okay. Um, and my last question is procedural. Will the school committee have to approve um, whatever new plan we are going forward with? Um, any requests for waivers that we might be making for Wednesdays or any others that you're considering? And will we have to approve a new MOU because obviously it's a whole new learning model than we have now? So again, um, in terms of the, the learning hours, moving to K-8, it's 25 hours, as I said earlier. So if we have our 25 hours of in-person learning a week, we do not need a waiver. Um, we're all set and ready to go. And I, I talked directly to the associate commissioner about that on uh, Friday afternoon, Rob Curtin. So um, no need for a vote by school committee because again, we're, we're following what Desi has put out there. Uh, in terms of uh, MOA, MOU, uh, we would be, we're, we're, we're going through a process associated with um, what the state is saying we need to do. So we're following through with that process at this time. Okay, that but, wasn't, but, it wasn't clear working, actually. <laughs> but we're working with the teachers union, let's just say that. Okay, I guess I'll keep an eye on that because that's a question outstanding. It's not very clear and it is a change in their employment contract that we currently have. So I'll let you sort that out, but I may ask that again. Um, do we have to approve any formal plan that you're creating or moving forward with at some point? Nope, nope. Okay. I, I asked. I okay. asked uh, the the associate commissioner that exact question on Friday, and no. All right, thank you. I have uh, Sherry next. Uh, to go back to Linda's point about possibly changing teachers for remote kids, and to Melissa's point about uh, making sure that they have enough teacher face time, um, I I do think that kids need to stay with their teachers at this point, um, especially because. Now that we've gone down to a three foot distance in many of the schools, we're going to have a lot more close contacts. And once we do, what are we gonna do with those kids? We can't just lump them in with the rest of their remote kids, that'll be too many. So they're gonna to need to stay with their existing teacher. So that teacher is going to have to keep some kind of remote platform going. So I don't see a great benefit in combining those remote kids right now. Um, I do understand that, you know, it, Nobody wants to be the only one, but they're not going to be. I mean, I just don't see how that would how that would happen. Um, the other thing I just want to say is I do encourage the the push to to nine to twelve. I think that it's important for them, and I hope that we do it with or without Desi's direction to uh, and the start date. Um, I think that the date of the twenty sixth makes a ton of sense after vacation uh, and a great way to to finish off the year for them. Great, thank you, Sherry. And I can tell you, uh, Desi's return date for middle school students is, is actually Wednesday the 28th, which is just, I don't, know, I don't understand why it's even that time. And there's no return date for high school at this time. So I agree. And thank you, you know, the other part of, um, and thank you for bringing that other part up, the aspect of uh, close contacts and, you know, having seven or eight students who um, have, to be, have to be remote. Um, that's definitely something that we're going to have to be paying attention to because teachers will, and that's the expectation from Desi, if students are close contacts um, in their home, they're not just sick, they have to participate. So we'll be doing what we're doing right now. Thank you. Carl, next. All right. So a question, actually, well, so I have a couple questions and they're kind of really a especially as we're looking forward to looking forward to having a lot more students in our building so it's really a follow-up kind of 
based off of the outbreak that we had at Dawson earlier with where we ended up with a third of our staff out, multiple reported cases of in-school transmission, which is absolutely not what we're looking to do. And so my two questions are, first question was, what did we determine to be the proximate cause of that outbreak? And then our second question is what, like what modifications, what changes to our procedures have we put in place since then to drive that, drive the probability of another outbreak happening even further down? So, yeah, and again, Carl, I, I mean, I can go through that. Gosh, I'm just trying to think. I mean, in terms of the, you know, you know, outbreak, much of what happened was close contacts, you know, more than anything, in all honesty. So that's how it really broke down. That's why that's why we know when we do bring students back, it's gonna look an awful lot like that. Um, a lot of the other cases that were brought in weren't weren't tied back to the school. Uh, they were tied back to outside of school, but then even that became, you know, those people were close contacts. So um, it, it was, you know, a lot of it was timing. Uh, a lot of it was how we kind of, um, you know, unfortunately just we had one cluster of close contacts and that was that was um, an entire class. So that's really how that played out. Um, how we've kind of moved forward with it, and you know, it's going to look an awful lot like we, what we do um, now. And Chris, it, it'll, I'll get you in a sec. So as as we kind of move forward with this, we we just want to ensure that we're paying attention to um, where kids are sitting because we, the assigned seat piece is a very important part. I know it's more challenging in the, in the lower elementary levels, but it's definitely something that we're focusing on. You know, we're also looking at, you know, ensuring that we have um, all of the um, different types of um, processes in place in terms of having students uh, or staff, if they're not feeling well, they go to, they go to the nurse, they're you know immediately kind of in that in that uh, COVID room, and you know we, we go through the whole process of you know ensuring that now that we have the buy next test, we can do that right right then and there. So there are other things that we'll be able to kind of deal with uh, the issues if if those types of things arise. Um, but again, nothing. I, I can't sit here today and say you know I, I you know an outbreak's not going to happen or we're we're not going to have a, a a group of students get this um, because you know I can't guarantee that we, no one can guarantee that anywhere but we can take all the mitigation efforts that we put into into play and and really make sure that those are are fully executed in all of the buildings on a very regular basis chris did you want to add something yes i did uh dr mccall thanks um I just wanted to say that um, we did do a really deep dive into what was happening at Dawson and really understanding um, the close contact situation. And I just wanted to um, support what Dr. McCall was saying in terms of the mitigation strategies, but also to just suggest that some of what we discovered is, um, is, is related to students that we can't necessarily disclose through school committee. And so I don't want it to seem vague, um, but at the same time, I want to be clear that, um, you know, we're in a public forum and we're discussing as much as we possibly can. Um, the mitigation strategies are in place and we, um, and we analyze that situation very carefully to understand how to do things better, if you will. Thank you. All right. Thank you. And, and I guess that's, that is really kind of more what I was hoping to hear that with what happened, you guys took a look at it, kind of combed it over, looked for and found some things that you can kind of refine and kind of do a little bit differently. So again, we're not gonna, you're not gonna be able to drive things down to zero, but if you looked at it and you're like, oh, based on what we saw, we can make a few changes here that will make things go a little bit better, then that's moving us in a positive direction. Better direction, maybe positive is not the right adjective for this, but. We get that idea. Thanks, Carl. I have Laura next. Thank you. Um, so I guess to to follow up with um, what Member Artmar was was speaking about, my question um, is not necessarily about mitigation me measures, but more about capacity to conduct the contact tracing 
at our last meeting, I asked you if um, if we could scale up our contact tracing uh, measures with the number of people that would be entering our building when it opens. Um, and I heard a yes that we could in fact scale up. However, on uh, December 12th, um, at a facilities and security subcommittee meeting, there was a uh, an answer of no, that it couldn't be scaled up. And I, so I'm just trying to understand what changed between um, December and today, or, or at the time of our last meeting, what changed in terms of our capacity to do effective contact tracing um, has ha what 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 has changed essentially? Sure. So definitely in December, it was really tough because we didn't have the kids back in the building yet. So we were only dealing with a small number of kids that were in the building at the time. Since that time, we're now half, you know, we have half of our kids coming into the building basically um, at all times. So we've kind of under, we understand the process much more than we did at that time. Uh, it, you know, staff understand it, uh, principals understand it, nurses understand it. We have a better understanding uh, in the central office world. So when we're dealing with it, it's, um, uh, I, you know, again, December, we we spent hours upon hours upon hours going through these, uh, it, you know, looking at close contacts and we have spreadsheet after spreadsheet after spreadsheet when we would do these meetings, um, Saturday nights, Sunday nights, you know, it didn't matter. Uh, we were doing them all the time. And as we kind of went through this process, we were able to, you know, call down the important parts, focus on certain areas that we knew that's what we could focus on. And um, I, I feel as though we, we, we really have the process down. Um, Director Keenan has been instrumental in this. So, and, you know, Brennan, I don't know if you want to throw anything in on that. Uh, yeah, I mean, what you mentioned, Daryl, about the um, being on the other side of the learning curve is definitely a factor. Uh, we are um, declining cases in the area. Uh, they continue to come down back in December and January. There are a couple of days where we had almost 6,000 cases um, in Massachusetts. So, um, so that's a factor. And then also having staff uh, with the option of vaccination uh, coming up. So those are three factors that are um, making that more manageable now. And we also do have a contingency plan in place too, where our um, sub nurses could um, provide back end support on contact tracing. Um, as we com come back. So um, that's already uh, something we're discussing. Thanks, Brenda. So I'm hearing the process has gotten more efficient and we have um, some additional people who can step in to provide that kind of support if needed. Is that what I'm hearing correctly? Yes. yes. Okay. I have another, uh, one more, qu qu an observation, if I may, and then a question regarding that. Um, and it has to do with, um, with how we service our remote students. Um, I, uh, as you know, I teach in another district and I have seen uh, students changing models between a hybrid model and a remote model um, effectively all year. Students have chosen to go from one model and change teachers uh, to another. Um, and I have, I have felt, anecdotally I can offer, that it has felt um, just like any other student moving into a district and changing, changing teachers mid-year, um, students I have found to be highly adaptable um, and and rising to the challenges. And so I just offer that up as an alternative um, piece of uh, information to some of the hesitation that I'm hearing about um, about students having to change classes. I think it's different when there's an option versus a, a mandate. Um, so I'll just leave it at that. But um, I do wish that the district um, take a hard look at maintaining the capacity to do the streaming for classrooms so that we can service our quarantined uh, children uh, within the district who have to do quarantining. I think that that's an essential, we're, we're geared up for it. I think it's essential service. Um, and I think that that should, uh, we should try and maintain that. Um, and then I also would offer to, uh, to focus on the quality of the FaceTime that students are getting in being in remote, um, you know, what is that quality experience? Is it staying with the same teacher? Is it moving to a different teacher who can, um, you know, who can better service kids in a in a in a remote setting? I just I would offer us to think about the quality of the experience um, for our students, and it, and it may be different student by student depending on their social emotional uh, well being. 
So um, thank you for your time. Thank you. I have uh, Asima next. So I'm going to go back to what <clears throat> Linda brought up in terms of remote students. I'm really concerned about, I know we had a survey going out trying to figure out how many students are going to be remote. You said about 10 percent has come back um, <clears throat> saying that they're going to be remote. The question I have is we're not giving all the parents all the information. Um, it's been mentioned that, you know, you're thinking of changing teachers, you're thinking of changing maybe by subject. I'm not quite sure. I'm not understanding exactly what is changing. So what I am afraid of is we're asking parents to make decisions without full knowledge of how their child is going to be affected. If a parent chooses remote, I'm assuming they're basing it on the fact that their, their schedule, the teachers um, are going to remain the same. If anything changes, I would suggest if there's any way we can redo that survey, um, ask the parents with the appropriate information so that you know, we're not coming back in a week or two when 90% of students are coming back and those 10% of remote students are saying and parents are saying, we didn't know that this was the case and we want to revert now. And then we only have about, what, a few weeks left of school. By the time we get those kids to actually choose the correct choice, per se, I mean, I don't know what else words to use, we're going to be uh, giving them, what, a couple of weeks of what they really wanted. So I'm a little concerned about changing this midstream so late in the year and not giving enough information for the, those parents that have remote students and have opted for remote. So just wanted to re reiterate some of the concerns that have been mentioned. Yeah, thank you, Asma. And uh, Director Sklar, can you, can you talk a little bit about the survey? Yes. Um, so, so just as far as, you know, like um, redoing the survey or whatever, the way we have that set up, it's, it's in PowerSchool in the parent portal. And as we provide information to parents, uh, you know, more details this week on, on what to expect for in-person and remote learning, um, they can go right back into the same survey, change their uh, selections if they want to. So basically we'll be telling them at a certain point, if what you selected is good, leave it alone. If you want to make any changes, go ahead back in and do that. And then we can, based on the survey, you know, we did provide a not sure option for parents. So we can contact the specific parents that chose not sure and ask them to, you know, go back in and, and make a choice. So that that's all planned. Yeah, I'd just like to request that parents know exactly when they have to ultimately make that decision. I, I mean, I understand you're using this as metrics to decide how we're going to open schools, what space we have, et cetera, et cetera. But at some point, we I just want to make sure we're giving them all the information possible and then finally asking them to make a, a, a final decision and at least reminding them of it. Yes. And, so, and, and, go ahead. I'm sorry. So, go ahead. Thank you, Daryl. So just because um, I think it's timely to this conversation. So we have another school committee meeting scheduled for March 29th. I believe it's your intention to share the finalized details of what the return to school plan, not the task plan, but the actual re -school, return to school fully big details are going to be, correct? Yes. Okay, and so then I think Asma's question is, once that information is is understood, will parents have the opportunity to update their decisions based on that information? They will. Okay, okay. thank you. Thank you. Um, I have uh, Jeffrey next. So I, I, I'll preface this by saying I know it's preliminary and, and there's a lot to be worked on, but I'm just questioning, just have some questions about Wednesdays. Uh, well, I guess the week in, in general, you said it was 25 hours, um, and you would you would see that we'd get the 25 hours with a half day on Wednesday. Is that correct? And I'm only just I'm just yeah looking at say Glenwood's hours uh, nine ten to say two thirty. Um, so I, just, I, I know, and I know you're just uh, beginning, you know, getting those plans, but I'm trying to understand that before yep. we get to the 29th. Yeah, so what'll happen, Jeff, is the that 9, 10 to 10 to 2.30 time, that includes the hour each day that we're um, that's, that they're going home early. So we would revert back to our typical year time, which is where those extra hours would come in. Okay, thank you. That's a good question. All right, going back to Linda long -Bleal. Yes, uh, very quickly. Um, I know you're going to have a million logistics to deal with, but if the example you outlined 
where there's one student who's remote um, and there's another class that that student could be transferred into um, comes to pass. Um, my thought is that the ideal uh, option would be to give that that family, the family of the one student, the option of either staying with the teacher they've had as the one student, potentially joined by others, as Sherry Haber um, pointed out, but potentially also as just one student or to transfer to a different teacher. I think that they should have that choice, um, if at all possible. So that's my comment. Thank you. Thank you, Linda. Definitely look at that. Mm -hmm. Going back to Mike. Thank you. I have uh, just a couple clarifications and a uh, comment. One is, uh, can you clarify? So the Binex testing, that is the rapid test, not pool testing. Is that correct? Or? Correct. Okay, thank you. And is that being used in the school currently? It's ready to go now. I don't know if it's been used yet, but I think today was the first day it could have been used. Okay. Is, is that for, uh, under what circumstances is that used right now? Uh, someone that's exhibiting symptoms. Okay, thank and you. And it could be student and or staff. And I'd like to um, uh, kind of review and maybe Rob Berlow could speak to this. Uh, I know we speak, spoke at our last facilities and subcommittee meeting. Uh, the What's shown on the dashboard is assumes in-school transmissions. There's no way to completely confirm that it's an in-school transmission. This is assumed based on context and what's been happening with contact tracing. Correct. The last thing, the last thing I have is uh, I'd like to e echo member Christenbaum's concern about quality of education when it comes to um, moving uh, a bunch of people mentioned with uh, whether keeping your teacher if a uh, child is to stay remote. Uh, I don't want to push any decision based on that. I'd just like to echo the concerns about uh, quality of education, especially when you consider a class, as we've reviewed at other meetings, uh, when you have a class of, say, 20 kids that are in person, getting the in-person experience versus four that are remote and um, getting equal, you know, one-on-one -on -one time, if you will, or equal teacher time. Thank you. Thank you. I have uh, Sherry. Go back to Sherry. Can I just have a quick clarification on dates? I feel like at the beginning of this conversation, we were told that you were going to expect a firm answer from parents by the 22nd because we needed solid time for bus changes, et cetera, and for, for setting up the classrooms. Yet when we just, you just mentioned that uh, Mike said that we were gonna have all the information by our meeting on the 29th, and you said that they'd be able to change their mind until then. So can you yeah, clarify? Sherry. Sure, Sherry, I apologize. So we need to send out the information to families in reference to uh, what C is going to look like for them by this week. I mean, that's what has to happen because again, we need this information by the 22nd. A full plan presentation to school committee will happen on the 29th. Okay, so final decisions are being made by the 22nd. Yeah, because again, what will happen is if, we're, if we run into an issue and it's really busing and in person and what Desi actually within the guidance says, it, you know, it, it literally puts it out there four to six weeks of, of change time. So I, we, we will not say to a family, sorry, you're remote, you can't be in person, but it's going to take a while to be able to do that transportation wise. Uh, classroom wise, spacing wise, all of those types of things. So I have to take that into consideration. But we do need to have a defined time frame for then establishing routes and classes and stuff. Any other questions or comments regarding the return to school plan? Okay, seeing none, uh, we'll move on with the agenda, unfinished business. We don't have any unfinished business. Um, number six, the secretary's report. Uh, without objection, um, I um, suggest we hold the executive session meeting minutes until our next executive session, which will be tentatively scheduled on March 29th. Um, without exception, with, without objection rather, uh, I would take um, items H and I uh, approval of 1359 regular meeting school minutes and approval of 332 special meeting held on March 1st and March 8th, um, respectively. Um, without objection, I would accept those under anonymous consent. Those means meeting minutes are accepted. Item seven, treasurer's reports, financial statements. 
there. Father, do you have something? I do. Uh, the March 1st meeting, I was absent. And so I'm abstaining. Okay. And that's not reflected in the minutes. It says I was present. So, Randy, can we make that modification to the March 1 minutes? Yes. No Thank objection you. to make a modification. Will any other objections or modifications? Hearing none, we'll move forward. Uh, Treasury report financial statements. Um, uh, I don't, there's nothing uh, here indicated specifically from Director Deity. Committee reports, management subcommittee, um, quick update. Management subcommittee met on, uh, I guess it was this past Thursday. Um, we discussed um, this process a bit. We discussed um, plans for um, uh, assessment, systematic assessment of student learning and the impact of student learning for this year. Um, and we will be uh, meeting again also uh, regarding district indicators and update on the strategic plan. And we'll be meeting again on, I believe it's April 1st, Thursday, April 1st. Uh, moving on to committee report updates from education subcommittee. We'll have Vice Chair Linda Long Belio report. I wasn't at the last meeting she chaired. Oh. Yes, sorry, okay. I <laughs> I actually had forgotten that I had chaired that meeting. Um, so um, if you could actually go to a different report and I'll look back at my notes <laughs> as to what we did, if you don't mind. Sure, no problem. So we'll, Thank you. No problem. So we'll go to business finance. So we last met on March 2nd. Uh, for the most part, you know, we, we talked about the upcoming budget save for two items. We talked about the uh, with the cafeteria and the athletics revolving accounts and, and the status of those uh, uh, in terms particularly of cafeteria. That's been a challenging, evolving um, uh, account, which will continue, I'm sure, to evolve as more kids come back into the school. There's been fewer kids picking up lunches than one might have anticipated. Uh, so, uh, Ms. Barton and, and Mr. Didi have had to adjust um, uh, on, on the fly there. Uh, so, um, we don't have an next meeting schedule, but, um, but uh, Randy will need to, to set that up if we can, uh, can get that on the books. Thank you, Ken. Moving on to legal affairs. I think Scott I, is live. I don't, yeah, I don't see Scott on here. So uh, we had our last meeting on uh, Wednesday the 10th. We uh, reviewed legal bills, approved some minutes, and then we jumped into executive session talking about uh, various negotiations that we've got. We don't have, I don't believe we have a schedule, we have a firm date for our next uh, legal affairs, but we were talk, talking tentatively, talking maybe about the 24th, so next week. Thank you. Superintendent Goals. Thanks, Mike. Um, we're meeting a week from, from this evening on the 22nd. Um, we will be outlining the, the agenda as we move forward in terms of completing the evaluation. So what that schedule event looks like for this committee. I think one thing that you all can look forward to is a little more definition in terms of how how the rubric will be measured by each of us to maintain consistency. So when we when there is the aggregate, um, which is the output of the evaluation, that we're all um, looking at the evaluation from the same level of of how we're interpreting that rubric. So more to come on that meeting is next week and we'll report back to the full committee afterwards. Thank you, Matt. Uh, facilities and security? Uh, we haven't met since our last full school committee meeting, but we are planning to meet on the 25th um, at 6.30. Um, then we're hoping to squeeze in a, I'm looking to schedule another meeting shortly thereafter for um, some of the more administrative aspects since I assume the 25th is going to be mostly about reopening again. So that's it. Thank you. 
Uh, diversity, equity, and anti-racism. We met on the 23rd and we started discussing the policy and I believe that was called the promoting civil rights and prohib um, prohibiting harassment, discrimination, and hate crime. A lot to discuss and we're continuing discussing that. Thank you. And I believe in our next meeting, just as an update, I believe in our next meeting, Daryl is going to join us. Yes, I will be. Sounds good, I'm done. All right, uh, on advisory, Ben. Yeah, we have not met uh, for this year yet. We're waiting for the, um, at least the initial report from our uh, auditor. So I'll work with Dan on trying to figure out when that will be ready and get the group together. Okay. Going back to uh, education, Linda. Yes. Are you ready for it? Yeah, I am. Right. Um, we discussed Go. the technology plan and the textbook plan. Um, we reviewed a little bit about um, class sizes and uh, district indicators, and our next meeting is uh, next Monday, the 22nd. Great, thank you. And then going back, business finance. So, Ken, there was a question from uh, Member Gustafson on the election of a vice chair for business finance. Yeah, she is. Uh, we elected her as vice chair, <laughs> Member Gustafson. So, congratulations. <laughs> it's just to make sure. Was, was she there? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, she was. She was yeah. Yeah, yeah I, I oh. was silent the least amount of time, apparently. So, yes. <laughs> and a fine vice chair she will be. <laughs> it's only go. for Absolutely. three months. Just don't go on any business trips, Ken. <laughs> All right, good stuff. So, moving on to ad hoc subcommittees, uh, ad hoc subcommittee to review the regional agreement. Back to you, Ken. Yes, yeah, so so we met as a committee and we elected a vice chair. Oh my goodness, uh, this is this is bad. Uh, I want to say that it was Ben. Um, anyhow, uh, we uh, we um, we have a plan. So we are we communicated to the towns that we would have a virtual public hearing on April the eighth. Uh, we asked them for written input by that date if they so desired. Uh, we communicated that to the uh town managers the chair of the boards of select persons and the chairs of the finance committees um we uh will then put the we also have asked administration for their input about things they might like to see uh, this will then be a topic for discussion at, at the school committee meeting on april 12th the subcommittee will get back together on the 14th to um to process all this information and see if any changes are warranted um and um and if so we've asked the towns if possible to put a placeholder warrant uh, on their town meetings if not it would require a special town meeting uh to to make any any changes uh to to the regional agreement um so that's kind of where where we are right now thank you ken it looks like um bob you have a question through the chair for about uh, regional no, it's not a question. I'm just putting my input in before I, I check out here. Having been on three of those committees uh, previously, um, I, again, I, I'd argue having extensively looked at a lot of data that um, both Paxton and Princeton still have two members. And, and the idea of going to sort of weighted voting uh, which is the only other alternative, is is very labor intensive and um, and in terms of Paxton and Princeton, uh, if you have one member that's out, and then if you, if you go down to one member, and that one member is out, it creates a severe problem for both of those towns. It's really a problem, and and so I would advocate strongly that you continue a similar sort of situation where those towns have at least their two members. It's sort of a senatorial model if you, if you want something that's analogous. So it's, I'm just putting my two cents in. Thanks. Thank you, Bob. Yeah, and, and you'll have an opportunity, as, and every other member will have an opportunity to weigh in on the regional agreement. We take it up in depth um, either at public hearing, but certainly through our meeting on, on April 12th. Um, Nothing else, we'll move on to building committees. There's nothing under building committees. School council report, does anyone have a, does anyone have a school council report that they wish to provide?
Uh, let's see, I have Linda and then Ken. Linda Woodland. So the uh, ECC Simco met, um, I think it was a, uh, I think it was last week, um, and uh, um, the, we talked about how um, the ECC has gone through some kind of um, uh, rebuilding, if you will, for after the, I don't know if you recall, before the holidays, there were a lot of infections, a lot of shutdowns that had to happen. So there was um, uh, some opportunities that they took to kind of bring everybody back together um, and everything so far that they've been in full reopening has been going uh, has been going smoothly. And so hopefully I'm not jinxing it by announcing that. Um, the uh, we talked about the school improvement plan going over um, uh, responding to student learning needs, acting upon student learning data, some facilities adjustments, um, and uh, expanding community engagement for the families. Um, and then we also talked about the Special Olympics that are coming up and the question of delaying it so that perhaps it can be in person for the preschool um, or to do virtual. And so that's, that's what's been going on at the ECC. Thanks. Thank you, Ken. Yeah, so briefly at the high school, we had a useful conversation about the experiences of the students who are currently in hybrid and, and uh, the percentage discussion about you know, why the percentages perhaps are what they are. Uh, we talked about uh, some of the strategies and challenges and possible solutions to those challenges of re-entering into the high school. And uh, our next Simcoe meeting, I think it's going to be only the 6th or 13th of April, and the Simcoe plans to take a tour uh, so that we can see some of the, uh, the factors that might allow students to be coming back in person. Great, thank you. Anyone else on student council reports? Seeing none, we'll move to the second public hearing. Um, I don't see that anyone has signed up. Randy or Barry, is other different information? Nope. Okay. Um, next item, under new business. Does any member have items for new business that they would like for us to take up at a future school committee meeting? Seeing none, I would entertain a motion to adjourn. So moved. So moved. Second. Second. It's been moved and seconded. Randy, can you call the roll? Okay. Member Ayala? Ayala, yes. Member Bennett? Bennett, yes. Member Brown? I think he's left. Member Gustafson? Yes. Member Haber? Yes. Member Ember? Yes. Member Knowlton? Knowlton, yes. Member Kirschenbaum? Kirschenbaum, yes. Member Lavoy? Lavoy, yes. Member Longleal? Longleal, yes. Member Mills? Mills, yes. Member Mitchell? Mitchell, yes. Member Otmar? Otmar, yes. Member Pantos? Pantos, yes. Member Shapiro? Shapiro, yes. Member Silva? Silva, yes. Member Smith? Smith, yes. Member Sullivan? Sullivan, yes. Member Williamson? Williamson, yes. Member Woodland? Woodland, yes. Yeah. Member Young? Young, yes. Chair Dennis? Dennis, yes. Our meeting's adjourned. Thank you, everyone. Have a great night. Thank you.